How is everybody this morning? Um, just before we get started, I just wanted to um, tell you, I was, I was in uh, Cupertino earlier this week uh, at the Apple event, um, and uh, you know, the launch of the Vision Pro, and boy, I'm, I'm so inspired because Apple does such a good job presenting things, and uh, they're such a good event organizer and an event marketer. Um, and so I'm really kind of trying to get, uh, you know, learning from them. Um, but they, they don't persuade with data. It's funny, you know, they, they, they don't persuade with a lot of charts as I do. Uh, it, they try to persuade with, with the products themselves. Um, and our product is our show. Uh, so we try to impress and we try to persuade with our own um, uh, our own organization here. So thank you so much for, for being a part of it. Um, as Julia said, uh, micromobility is growing. Uh, it's been growing ever since it was born. It continues to grow, even though we've had catastrophes on the global scale. Uh, the pandemic, uh, obviously, uh, possibly macroeconomic issues as well, um, and we're moving into uh, uh, you know global conflict potentially, and yet it's growing. And um, I th I was never in doubt about that because I felt that this was a, a phenomenon that would would um, be driven by human behaviors and human uh, uh, um, no no you know norms, and and these are moving in the direction that we expected. But my job now is to understand how big it gets, right? How big is micromobility going to be? And micromobility um, is, is challenged by measurement. Uh, how do you measure success? Uh, do you measure number of vehicles? Do you measure dollars? Do you measure miles? We talked a little bit about all of these. Um, but I think the most important measurement is users, or as we call them, riders. Um, automobility is measured by vehicles and rarely by their users, which are called drivers. So our, user, our users are riders. We want to make that distinction. We want to say riding is fun, driving is work. Driving is hard, riding is easy. This is important because I think micromobility has a sense of freedom, has a sense of uh, uh, liberty and joy. Uh, so how many riders will there be? Well, obviously, I'm making an assertion now. Um, we're calling this the total addressable market question. And it doesn't begin with sort of dividing the world uh, into haves and have-nots, or rich or poor. I see people feel free to come on in and, 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 and t t grab a seat. Um, we are talking about... Um, billions of consumers, potentially users, riders. But the, the, uh, the way to do it, the way I've been taught to do this sort of analysis is by beginning with categorization. In other words, finding the subsets that determine the cause of this change. So the causes, as shown in this very, very uh, esoteric slide, is you know, things like jobs to be done. How do you categorize the things that people have to do? And we begin with trip distance. We have to also understand the externalities, the fact that there are certain modes and there are certain consumption and there's a certain amount of emission that each uh, of these modes generates, and that's being measured already. We have the population data, which is very well understood, very well detailed, very well projected, uh, and very uh, subdivided into categories of its own. We also have motorization data, which is actually an important pretext to the whole story um, and how that has happened over the last century, especially uh, during the you know, uh, 20th century, uh, as we saw um, the adoption of the automobile. And then we're looking at the evolution of the electric vehicle markets, which of course are important, but they are really about automotive at this time mostly. And so we'll conclude with our forecast of how much, how much what is this market, uh, how, how, to, how to measure it. So beginning with jobs to be done, um, is this my pointer? Yes, I have a pointer. Um, so th there is a, a data on the um, 
trip distances out there, but it's hard to find. So I try to summarize it with 50 different modes over the years. I sort of became a collector of modal data. Um, and what the, way, the way to read this graph, even though it's sort of hard to read, um, is that there are these mode types down here, and then we have distances up here, and then we have bands which represent uh, the median in the center, and then two-thirds plus or minus from that, that's one standard deviation, and 95%, which is two standard deviations, from that median. So it sort of looks like there's a symmetry, there's a range of distances that each mode is typically used for. And here you see the giant leap to, uh, to aviation, where, where aircraft are distinct from sort of land-based travel, which is all of this. Um, but note that this is a logarithmic scale. In other words, every line is 10 times more than the previous line. And so what it, what, you, you know, if you, this wasn't um, this way, it would look like, you know, like a, a very steep uh, curve. And hard to get your eyes on, and um, this allows us to sort of see it more, more in a natural way. But, uh, but fundamentally, what's important is to see how many modes are actually very similar to each other in terms of what they're used for. Uh, so the jobs of trips and the distances that, that those imply uh, is, is an existing set, set of data. And then you take micromobility data and sort of compare that against the, the, uh, the sort of automobility data uh, and the shared mobility data and so on. And you get yet another picture, which uh, it sort of provides you with comfort. It provides you with a, with a realization that, that the types of jobs that we've been hiring big vehicles for are actually well served by small vehicles. So this is an exercise, again, in quantification, understanding the jobs. I've done this over the years. I've calculated the number of miles that are being demanded, the, the amount of miles that are being delivered by different modes, and, and assert, you know, asserted that the first trillion is the hardest trillion, but we're gonna get there. So we're in this process right now, of sort of conquering this market of trip distances. There's another constraint, however, which over the years has come into play, which is that CO2 emissions have become, let's say, a, um, a constraint, if not a, a determinant of the, uh, of the future. Uh, and this isn't my data, this is from the uh, IEA, and they um, project from, 20, from 2000 to 2070, you see from 2000 until the present, uh, we've seen increase in, in emissions, but this expectation that we're going to see a decrease in total emissions uh, with the components of being, you know, the, the, the modes or rather the, the transportation sectors uh, shown here, uh, each one contributing a certain amount. The, um, there's some which are more compressible than others. Obviously, aviation is difficult to compress, so that band tends to stay uh, flat. Shipping as well, which is you know large large vessels, that tends to be also more difficult to compress. But the big the big wins are going to come from passenger cars, which is this blue area here, as you can see, more almost half here, but becoming negligible by then. This is in the form in, in the sort of words of the IEA. This is sort of the necessary uh, condition that needs to occur in order for us to meet climate uh, change goals. Um, and this, this is a staying below um, two degrees of global climate change. So this is one other constraint that we have to concern, contend with. Um, at the same time, however, also from IEA, um, is how many vehicles will be in use. Again, over the same time frame, or roughly, till, this is till 2050, um, we're going to see an expansion in the global fleet of vehicles. And well, I've made my own estimates. Uh, sorry, I've made my own estimates here um, in blue, which are somewhat similar to the black line here behind. Uh, now, this is split into two colors. We have the OECD, or wealthy countries, and non-OECD, which are the poor countries. And you'll note that in 2000, not so long ago, almost all the vehicles in the world uh, which were at the time about 500 million, were in rich countries. But by 2050, which is not too far from now, uh, we're going to see about uh, one and a half times more uh, uh, poor country or emerging country or growing country um, population of vehicles versus a very small increase, relatively speaking, in the wealthy countries, which is where we are now. So the, the question is then, how are these going to be delivered? Um, how many vehicles are necessary? And this, uh, by, by the way, again, their forecast is perhaps a bit higher in the short term, but 
a bit lower than the in the long term from mine, but it's it's generally uh, a discussion about uh, you know uh, uh, minor points about how big this population is going to get of personal use of uh, vehicles. So these are again uh, expectations. These are drawn from a lot of data. Now let me introduce you to another data set, which is kind of an urbanization. Um, Julie also said she comes from a background of cities, and cities are our natural habitat. They're the, the, the home of the micromobility. We, we talked about this in Berlin uh, a few years back about, you know, what, does, what is micromobility more, you know, other than, than the um, uh, urban freedom, as we called it. Um, and so urbanization is very important, and urbanization turns out to be um, a predictor of wealth and a predictor of prosperity. Uh, and actually, you can go back to as long ago as the 1500s to see the data. And we can see how the countries that urbanized early, including the Netherlands, you see right here, being actually one of the wealthiest places in the world for a long time. This is from 1500 to 1900. So why was the Netherlands so prosperous? Is because it was the most urbanized country in the world um, for centuries. Um, and also, the, you know, we had uh, similar patterns in, in, in other parts of the world, but the relationship between urbanization and prosperity is something that historians take for granted. So what we're seeing today is an, a move to urbanize the non-wealthy um, uh, parts of the world. And if you look at this, this slide, for example, this is the global population. Um, but split into urban and rural. And again, 1900, the urban population was a tiny minority of the global population. And notice that the global population was below 2 billion people. Now, in, in today's world, 2020s or so, we've just crossed over 8 billion people. But the split between urban and rural is, again, flipped from being a majority rural to a majority urban. And um, in fact, the, the rural population has been fairly consistently, uh, st stayed consistent, but it will begin to decline uh, over this, or has already begun declining in, in 2000, and will be uh, continuing to decline. Now, I, I made a sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, commentary here with uh, these, uh, these uh, street signs. Uh, which indicate roughly how automobility sees the world. And you'll note that these are anachronistic. We have notions of trains looking like this, of cameras looking like this, of fire trucks and tractors and cars and motorcycles looking as if they were from a different century. Indeed, these were all created in the 1930s, and they are still in use today. And their worldview, therefore, of automobility was formed here at a time when most people actually were in rural environments. The, the, the Model T, the Volkswagen Beetle, those cars were built even in the West at a time when most people did not live in cities. And yet we are carrying that legacy to this day in automobility. And micromobility is a mode born and bred in cities. It's the first mode to exist as such. Therefore, urbanization, is a, is a trend that is not reversing and will continue into this century towards uh, all the way through it. Um, and we talked about emissions. Now let's juxtapose these things. Let's talk about car populations, let's talk about emissions, and let's talk about urbanization at the same time. If you do that, you end up with this graph. This yellow, uh, so yellow on top of yellow, but this dark yellow is the CO2 emissions expectations. These are more or less set in stone. These are going to be regulated by, by governments. Uh, urban population, which you've just seen, is going to look like this. Uh, vehicle population, the two, the two predictions you see down here are going to look like this. Obviously, as I said, urban and mobility are kind of correlated. But what has to happen is at the same time as these enormous growths, enormous demand is burgeoning we're going to have to tighten our belts with respect to emissions. This goes without saying, I'm only stating the obvious here. But how do we do this? How can we have a vast increase in consumption of mobility with a vast decrease and almost elimination of the byproduct of such consumption? 
Um, and of course, the unstated assumption is that it's, it's going to come from us, and we have to deliver that. Um, just to also put a finer point on where this growth has to happen, this is motorization and economic maturity. These are the countries that are actually having the lowest amount of mobility today in terms of automobility. Here we see this first cohort, and you can maybe read some of these names. Uh, you know, we see here the Philippines, we see here Senegal, we see here Mali, Liberia, etc. Nigeria is here as well. Fairly large country, actually. Uh, and then we have here sort of the middle e income economies. And you see there, this is, by the way, the percentage uh, of population that has access to personal mobility in the form of automobility today. And you see the sort of the middle tier. And then we have the higher tier. And uh, more or less, this is the, uh, this is the, the wealthy country list. Um, even here, there's some variance between maybe something around the, the, low, the, the 40, 30, 40 percent up to about 80 percent, which is where, where the United States is. I think that's the green line here. So again, where's the opportunity uh, when we look at it on this level of geographic uh, detail? Uh, clearly, the non-consuming markets are these and, and these. And uh, that, that is where demand is going to grow. Now, to actually predict um, the vehicle market that we've been talking about, there are several attempts at doing this in several scenarios. So uh, this is far too detailed to get into at this time, but it, I'll say that the IEA last year uh, and, Mark, and us, Micromobility Industries, we have taken stabs at this and try to predict the split between uh, the, the types of uh, transport modes that we're gonna have available and the CO2 emissions, and therefore can we do that vast growth with a vast decline at the same time in terms of emissions? And the answer is no, we cannot. Not with the technology that electric um, uh, automobiles offer, because that is the assumption built into a lot of these predictions. As Julia also said about clean tech, we are focusing so much on the salvation, if you will, of the automobile, the salvation that we will have from electric cars, that if only we're investing in their manufacture, in their development, that we will have this problem solved. With many also saying that it's about also self-driving vehicles, which have even more power to reduce uh, the emission by, by being shared, by being having higher utilization. So the, the, the argument of communicating, intelligent, self-driving, shared, cars has been pretty much uh, baked into forecasts of the transportation sector being compliant with what is this necessary uh, uh, reduction in emissions. However, however, if you really follow the, the, the data and you do the calculations, you'll see that manufacturing these vehicles in the numbers necessary is going to have a very high impact on climate in the short term and in the medium term. We're talking about billions of vehicles weighing thousands of kilograms each. That's an obvious, uh, um, you don't even need to do the math on that. But also, more importantly, is that the markets that need this technology, as I said, those countries that are less, um, less wealthy, they cannot afford a $50,000 electric car for every citizen or every family. That is not possible even in the wealthiest countries today. So the, the, the market, by the way, there are four used cars sold for every new car. So the market for existing internal combustions, the combustion engines that have been already manufactured some time ago will carry on for decades forward simply because that market has to drain itself out. Those vehicles have to somehow either be banned outright or and therefore scrapped, or they have to be sort of worn out but through heavy use. And there's also the possibility of taking worn out vehicles to these emerging markets, but that does not solve the problem. Obviously, they will emit into the same atmosphere we have. So you do a lot of calculations, you do a lot of math to try to figure out how we're going to square this circle. Um, and so, a lot of data, a lot of analysis, and I invite you to sort of reach out and ask how to do this better. I'm happy to collaborate, but I've looked at these different modes, I've tried to categorize them, and then ask this question, from the, from the micromobility world. How do we build up the 
performance of our product, but also the popularity of our product in terms of getting more, more and more people to do this. So, so here are all the different sub-modes I could discover about uh, that are in the micromobility world. These modes are actually defined by government and policy, and they're somewhat abstract. You know, European standards, American standards, uh, China, Asia, etc. So, you know, they vary around the world. And one of the reasons I, I actually use the word micromobility is because I couldn't use all these words. Uh, these words are too many words to be used to describe a thing uh, because we have fragmented over the years everything that is not a car. And it's, it's, uh, it's as a result, we have to somehow understand that this is all part of one, one uh, phenomenon. So enter micromobility. This is the promise. We think that at least even th this very crude categorization and clustering that we're talking about result in this view of the number of vehicles that we see in use, or at least it's sold, uh, if not in use, uh, over the next few decades. So this is a, a graph from 2010 to 2030, split into uh, bicycles here, which are human powered, uh, electric vehicles, which are, which are these, which include automobility, but also these micromobility types, which include bicycles, scooters, four wheelers, and two and three wheels. And then we end up with uh, uh, automobility market is this gray area, either combustion, uh, sorry, um, there's also micromobility, combustion-based mi micromobility, which is, which is the motorcycle and moped world, which is uh, in this gray, this gray zone here. So obviously you wanna decrease the gray as much as possible, increase this as much as possible. But if you were to split this up, you'll see that automobility is a minority of the entire growth opportunity in electric mobility. Now we've probably seen this before, but I'm, I'm trying to simply um, uh, break it down further so we can actually decide whether these are reachable and just how big they are. So as a result, let's split electric from internal combustion, and we see this picture uh, sort of stagnating and declining, perhaps, uh, consumption of combustion engines with a, with a growth in, but these are on the same scale, and you'll note that automobility, which is blue, is going from this kind of scenario uh, yes, there'll be a reduction, but generally electric is going to be very hard to crank at the speed we need. While at the same time, micromobility, especially the electric kind, will emerge as, as, a, as a very rapid growth. And this is about only about, well, effectively four and a half, uh, sorry, um, 2030 is, we're, we're going into 2040, so about six years away. Um, the projection, again, was 2050, 2070 on emissions. Uh, we have to look at what we're going to see for, for micromobility out at that scale, but it's very hard, obviously, to predict on a granular level at that scale. But fundamentally, what does this mean? I think this exercise demonstrates that micromobility can scale, and it can scale in the two constraints that we have. One, the demand for urban mobility and the demand for mobilizing the next few billion people. And secondly, it can do so without causing the footprint that will be um, also a constraint, obviously. The, this, is, this is why, um, as an exercise, and I think we need to invite IEA, we need to invite the uh, uh, COP uh, and other uh, forums to take a look at micromobility and not see it as some sort of hobby, not see it as some, some sort of uh, fringe movement, but rather as the solution to the global problem, solution to the mobility problem. And also, let's not forget that today there are 1 billion drivers, approximately, about 1.1 to 1 1.3 um, personal automobiles are in use, and that means licensed automobile drivers. And uh, that is out of a population of uh, 8 billion people. And as we saw in the demand curves, both in terms of growing wealth, in terms of growing urbanization, we're going to see demand for billions more. And so the, the provision of micromobility for both supplying existing demand in, in existing markets, which are uh, enabled by auto, automobility today, uh, will be uh, positioned for, for a growth in the emerging markets of phenomenal phenomenal scale. Um, we're going to see billions of people gain mobility for the first time uh, 
in their lives and the first time in their, in their uh, nations uh, using this technology. And as a result, they will become prosperous. They will become um, mobile. They will, become, they will gain access and they will gain equity in the world while providing um, a minimal impact uh, in the environment. Uh, and that is the promise. That is, that is provable, I believe. That is demonstrable through what we see today uh, at this event. And, and as a result, of course, it's a benefit for all, but I think also it's a, it's a financial benefit, which is necessary because it's the fuel for growth. Uh, so EVs are, that are not cars uh, look like this, and the EVs that are cars look like this. Again, a three-dimensional view. Maybe next time we meet, we'll have all be wearing these new vision type uh, AR glasses, and we'll do, navigate all this data with, with, uh, with uh, um, 3D, but th that's as close as I can get today. This is what it looks like, and this is what we're hoping, uh, or we're, we're expecting, actually. Um, in terms of vehicle pricing, by the way, this is the other thing that, that the data is available for. If you look at the pricing of automobiles in the United States, the, the trend is one of, of increasing. So electric is in blue, uh, internal combustion is in, uh, is in um, um, uh, gray, and then the combined is in, is in yellow. So you, you end up with a, a scenario of, of through 2030, an expectation that automobile prices will continue to rise. They have been rising dramatically. In fact, they've gone from about 25,000 to about 50,000 in just a few years. Think about that for a moment. Um, similar trend in, uh, in Europe, in China, and worldwide as a result. And so we end up with this, with this phenomenon of increasing automobile pricing, while at the same time trying to predict Micromobility pricing is not so easy. Now, we do expect some rise. There's, there's obviously inflation going on, uh, but this is our model. It's trying to predict all of these subcategories of two to three and four wheels, uh, bicycles, et cetera, but over, and scooters. Overall, there is going to be a growth, uh, but notice that if I go back and forth here, you'll see this, this is in the tens of thousands, right? 10 to 70,000, all of these graphs. But if you look at micromobility, these are all different. It's like, this is a $1,500 pricing. This is 26, seven and 16 for different modes, right? So we're dealing with a significant lower price bands for, uh, for micromobility. And as a result, uh, the vehicle market itself, right? There's, we talked about users, but we'll talk about dollars for a moment. The vehicle market, uh, we're looking at the creation of $500 billion. So half a trillion dollars approximately will be created in terms of new demand um, and obviously, I'm not showing the automotive numbers, they're, they're phenomenal, uh, but the, the problem there is, again, sustainability. This is the sort of pricing and this is the sort of market that can be created and can exist. So I've been talking a lot about data here, a lot of things, and, and pointing out that what, what we're trying to do is, 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 is demonstrate to others the potential here with quantification, with, with uh, um, let's say, logic. However, I'm here also to tell you that we will not convince people uh, using this data. Uh, we may overcome objections. We may be able to stay in the room uh, with this data. But the fundamental reason people change behaviors is because they feel something. And they will feel mostly either fear or joy. And the feelings that micromobility should instill upon people is those of joy. It is, a, it is a technology, an idea, which should inspire. And so, although I'm driven by data, and I think data is important, I cannot say that it is sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. What matters most is that we touch people's hearts. And we understand that they will move with us once they come to love us. And so let's not forget that. And let's make sure that whatever we do, we do out of a sense of love. And uh, that is why I'm here. And that's why I love you all. So thank you for coming. <laughs>